welcome Michelle mm -hmm. and welcome Lina from Odessa. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be with this group and to be able to share this story. I titled it uh, um, Peace Through Story Revisited 2022 and for a reason because this truly has been a full circle moment for me to have this opportunity to have connection now in Ukraine, a place that I loved when I was there. And I will be, um, uh, Liana uh, Igana is an associate professor of linguistics and the professor that I've been working with over these last weeks. And so what I'd like to do is to provide, provide you with the backstory of how this all came to be. And then uh, we, I will be asking for her uh, impressions in terms of the working with the students and what's going on with them, what's going on with her, how things are. And so I'm just so honored that she could join us from that long way away. <laughs> it's a pleasure. The, um, when I think about this journey of these last really 40 years uh, that I've been working with the power of story and education, healthcare, citizen diplomacy, and in the corporate environment, it all came out of a, a meditation uh, that I had one morning where I saw a globe and hands underneath it, holding it up, and the words over the top were peace through story. And it was such a powerful image that uh, I actually quit my position as director of development for the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. I had just completed uh, directing a $2.8 million campaign successfully and stepped out without a strategy, without a plan, to be a, a storyteller who brings about peace in the world through story. I had a background as a former children's librarian and, I, and all, but this was different. This was really a focused effort to bring peace into the world through story, even though I wasn't sure exactly what that was to look like. And it was several years later, after I started working in schools and storytelling and teach and keynoting at conferences, that I woke up from a dream that said I was to go to the Soviet Union. And I had remembered hearing Dane and Perry, whom some of you may know, who was the founder of Earth Stewards Network, speak at a Unity Church Sunday morning about going to the Soviet Union, but it hadn't connected with me at that time. And yet here was this dream, I was supposed to go. So I called Dana and he said, well, getting a visa is a little challenging at this late date. It was three weeks away to fly at that point. But he said, uh, I, let me see what I can do. In the meantime, this is a citizen diplomacy effort, Michelle. And so we would like you to engage as much of your community as you can in these few short weeks. Well, I happened to be storytelling, performing at a young authors conference that weekend for the Lake Washington School District. I mentioned it to the school administrator. He put me in a room with all the principals. I told them about the opportunity. And three weeks later, I had 2,000 letters from children asking for peace, wishing peace, sending love, sending hope, sending, sending the possibility of connection between our two countries. In addition, in my luggage, there were uh, about 24 butterflies that were so beautifully made by one class that I knew I would gift in a very special situation when I got there. When I arrived in Moscow with the rest of, the, of our group, when I saw that flag for the first time, the hammer, the sickle, my throat just constricted because I grew up in Alaska. When the sirens would go off, we would go into the bomb shelters. And here I was in the land of the enemy. And yet what I came to discover as we always do, the enemy is not the enemy. <laughs> These are our brothers and our sisters and our children our mothers and our fathers, our grandmothers and our grandfathers. We had extraordinary experiences, but the one that really, really catapulted me into a place I didn't expect to go was when we were at school number 15 in Moscow and the children performed for a Cinderella. And it was as a play and to hear these little children and they were telling the Western version of it, so we, it was familiar to us. We sat there and sobbed. And then afterward, uh, one of the people in our group said, well, you know, we have a professional storyteller with us. Do you, would you like her to tell stories? And she said, of course. 
And I was prepared because I, I, knowing these children were learning English, I knew if they, if I could tell Russian fairy tales that would be familiar to them, then it would be easier for them to follow along with the English. And so that's exactly what I did. I told Snogorichka, the snow child, and the frog princess, and, and Baba Yaga, and the kind-hearted little girl. Oh, my. What a nice little thing. Well, you just come over here and weave a bit at this loom, and I will go and get you your needle and thread. <laughs> so on. So afterward, the kids came up to me and they said, Michelle Gabriel, would you come back to the Soviet Union? Would you bring more stories inside of your head? And would you bring children to help tell them? And I said, yes. <laughs> and then I got back after that trip and I thought, what have I done? I don't have a nonprofit. I, I'm just starting my storytelling practice. I you know, I don't even know where to begin, but I had um, made a promise. And so I began to tell myself a story about what it would look like if children from the United States could share stories with children from the Soviet Union, and if we could find the stories that we loved and, and be able to share them as a way of bringing us together, as a way of establishing relationships that could last a lifetime, I went on and on. The story was starting to sound pretty good to me, so I started sharing it with other people, and it seemed to resonate. And Young Storytellers for Peace was born. And I ended up interviewing 137 children for the 27 spots that were available, ages 10 to 15. The children trained for a year as storytellers and citizen diplomats. And away we went to the Soviet Union. And we raised money in lots of little pockets and places. In fact, I said to the parents of the children, even if you could write a check, I don't want you to. Because these children need to understand that when they go to a country and people are in many cases meeting Americans for the first time, it isn't just them, it's all the people they represent and the love that they carry. And if we're out doing storytelling event after storytelling event, raising the money, they will have that sense of obligation, not just to themselves and their experience, but to all the people whose blessings they're carrying with them. And that's exactly what happened. I also, as I travel from Moscow and then Odessa in Ukraine and then on to Leningrad, I wanted the children to have relationships. So I put together a notebook with all their interests and pictures and talents. And we actually paired them with a partner in each of those locations, each of the schools in each of those locations so that they, they would have the possibility of a long-time relationship that would result in connections that we so desperately needed. Those young storytellers had an extraordinary experience. Public television came along, did a documentary film, and it changed their lives. They moved on, these young people did, into careers that took them across the world, languages they never expected to learn, all seeded by that singular experience of being citizen diplomats between the ages of 10 and 15. The next year I took teachers. And again, extraordinary experiences that resulted in an organization that had teacher exchanges for the next 12 years. I know when I travel through some other schools, I think, you know, things look so bleak and what could we do to change this? And how could we bring story in? So I created something called the US Story Banner Project and invited schools and families and churches across the US to illustrate their favorite stories on fabric, with paint and with stitching and with other mediums, some of them six feet wide, then to write up the story and then send letters of peace and we could take them all with us and we could give them out and tell the stories and they could be hung in classrooms and pioneer palaces across the Soviet Union. And that's exactly what happened. Over 200 of those fabric banners went. And we did a big show of them at the Bellevue Museum. I was living in Washington State near Seattle. And I remembered looking at one that I so loved because it was of, of Peter Rabbit. And the, the, the scene they chose to illustrate on fabric was of Peter Rabbit with his blue coat on and his little gold button is cut in Mr. McGregor's gooseberry net. And, and even his, 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 one of his ears came flopping down. It was three-dimensional. 
And the teacher was there. She'd come from Eastern Washington for this big presentation of the banners. And I said to her, my goodness, it looks like you've got parents involved. Look at this stitching. She said, oh no, Michelle. Mm -mm -mm. Though those are not coming from, from parents. She said, our children, we have Mexican immigrants in our school. They learn how to sew when they're very young. And the children were so excited to think they could send something beautiful all the way to the Soviet Union. They would come into class at 7 a.m. in the morning before school so they could do the stitching. So they could do the stitching. And so with each of those trips, there were more connections but I found myself particularly drawn to Ukraine and to Odessa and to the amazing people that I was meeting there and the ways in which our lives were starting to intertwine. And then I got a call asking me if I would do a film series for Soviet national television that reached 50 million viewers across the former Soviet Union. And I, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's, I, so, so I said, of course, yes. They said, you know, we really can't pay you. And I said, well, I'm not getting paid for this other either. So I said, no, no problem. And so I flew there and did a film shoot. Now, one of the things I thought about it very, very much was which stories am I going to tell? Many of the stories I tell are from literature. They're, they're copyrighted. So of course I had to get permissions and others that are not that I tell from the folk tradition. But from the time I first started storytelling, something really important came to me. I would, in the US now, I would go back to a school that I hadn't been to in two or three years. And I would have children come up to me and say, oh, Michelle Gabriel, you know that story that you told when I was in first grade, that story about Epema, Epem, e Epemenondas, that little boy that didn't follow directions very well. And, and he even put that butter on his head and, and, and it just, it melted down all over his eyes. But I remembered that his mother loved him anyway. Three years ago, you remember all that? I'm a storyteller, I have a background, I have a master's degree in library science, I know the power of story. But in those moments, I realized, if I am telling stories that last in a child's heart that long, they need to be worthy of being there. They need to be worthy of being there. And even though I was only telling stories that I resonated with, I found myself looking again, making sure that my values and what was ma mattered to me as a teller was, was passed on to the children, stories about compassion and empathy and caring and forgiveness and celebrating one another and lifting one another up and stories that dealt with challenges, but overcoming those challenges, all of those things needed to be present. And so when I thought about what stories am I going to share on this television series that reaches 50 million viewers, I wanted them to be worthy of staying in a person's heart for a very long time. And so I flew to Moscow and I remembered saying to them, you know, I've been staying in tourist hotels and, and I know everything is pretty, it's a different experience when you're, when you're a Russian. So I said, would you mind putting me into a hotel that Russians would go to? Because many times they weren't even allowed in those hotels. We would have to meet our contacts out in the park. And of course the KGB, everything was wired in those days. So you always knew you never had a conversation, never named a person's name inside of your space. You always were careful about making sure, uh-huh, no one was listening. So as to compromise, it might compromise them, not us. We always felt safe. And so I, I, they did just exactly that. And I, I knew I was in a non interest hotel when I entered the front door of this hotel. And there was a huge pothole right there that I had to navigate every time I entered. And there was a woman on each floor that, uh, that would, I, would, I would walk past her. She would put my name down. I would walk past her again. She would put my name down again. And then in the restaurant, I would go to order and the waiter kept saying, niet, niet, niet. And I thought, why is he saying no to me all the time? And then I realized that even though there were many items listed on the menu, I had to look over into another column to see where the rubles were listed because those were the items that were available 
usually only five or six items on a given page. We did this, the shoot at, uh, at, at uh, was, uh, Peter the Great's, uh, one of his cabins, not the one, the beautiful one in, in Leningrad, but another one. And uh, we did, I did Baba Yaga in that setting, which was really quite magical. And then I, there was a, a, a fairy tale palace with paintings. And so I did some of the shoot there. We were in the studio for other parts of it. And I had a chance to interact with children. And, uh, and then it was, it, this was in 1987. I had already taken the teachers, done the film, and I thought that would be it. But then I, I was invited to come back to Odessa to present at Odessa National, it was called Odessa State University at the time. It is now Odessa National University. And I took with me a, a, a colleague, Dr. Arnie Nixon, professor of children's literature and storytelling. And so the two of us went and we did a program for the English speaking students, the very kinds of students that Leanna teaches now all the time. And there were about a hundred of them in the room. And so Arnie was storytelling and I was storytelling. And afterward, one of the professors stood up. He said, look at us, he said. Today, we have been to America to a one room schoolhouse. Today, he said, we have been to Siberia. We have been to the places where the hedgehogs roam. We have been to places we could not even imagine going and think about it, he said. We have not even left this room. And indeed we hadn't because our imaginations took us everywhere. And then in thinking about all the conversation from this morning, there was a young man who stood up and said, Michelle Gabriel, he said, do you have children? And I said, no, no, I, I have no children of my own. And he said, ah, <laughs> he said, Michelle Gabriel, we are all your children. And everybody applauded. And I thought, that's right. You are all my children. <laughs> and through my storytelling, I get to, during that moment, to be your mama. It was a powerful moment for them. It was an equally powerful moment for me. Now, by this time, the film series had already come out. And so I found myself being recognized on most every street. And one day in, in Moscow, because we were there also during that trip with Arnie, a gentleman came up to me. He introduced himself as a member of the Bolshoi Symphony. He said, Michelle Gabriel, do you know that story, the runaway bunny that you tell on TV? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> he said, Michelle, he said, I tell it to my two-year-old son every night before he goes to bed. And I'm in tears because I know that little boy is going to grow up with the memory of his papa telling him a beloved story and that that will bond them for the duration, forever, actually. What a gift that I was able to give him. What I didn't know, however, was that there was a young man in Odessa at a different school than the one that I spent so much time at, whose name was Roma, who watched that television series. And he fell in love with the Beatles, and he fell in love with the American storyteller who by now is called the Russian American Fairy Godmother is what my title became. I became known by that. And he was so inspired that he decided to study English because he was thought it was such a beautiful language. And he began to listen to those tapes so that he could resonate more with the storytelling. In fact, I've discovered that those tapes were used in pedagogical institutes to teach teachers of English across the country how to storytell with more expression. But Roman listened to those stories. And so as a result of that, he graduated. He went on to be an interpreter, a translator. He studied some in the United States. He ended up at the US Embassy in Moscow. And then he ended up back in Odessa as a citizen soldier. Roma contacted me on Facebook in 2017 and 
And, and he said, you know, I watched you on TV and I love your stories. And we changed, exchanged a little bit, but I, we hadn't communicated since. And then on the 24th of February, the war started. And he posted a picture of himself and his military guard with his rifle and talking about needing to defend his motherland and talking about talking about being invaded and talking about how precious his country was and talking about how important it was that he and others join in the fight. Well, I wrote to him. He wrote back, he said, oh, he said, fairy godmother, fairy godmother, he said, to hear from you. He said, it has moved my heart. And we started talking back and forth. He said, I, I remember your voice. He went on and on. And I thought, well, then I know what I need to do for this man. I need to send him audio recordings of stories. So I suggested we get on WhatsApp. I began to do that. His response was extraordinary. And I realized, oh, Michelle, this is the one small thing you can do. You can share stories with him. You can lift his spirits up. And so I began to look over my stories, the ones that I tell, personal stories as well, began to leave those for him, to give him courage and to give him hope. He began to share those with others, including Lena, our wonderful professor of linguistics. And she began to share them with her students. And then I asked him, I said, Roma, is, you know, is there anything I can do? Maybe I could do something for the students. And, and when I communicated with Lena, she said, absolutely, I want you to. So we got on the line together. We began to talk about the possibility of doing something for her students. And that's what we've been doing. And so what I want to do now is to give her an opportunity to share with you. But before I do, I want you to know something. There are people in our lives that move us so much, we never forget them. My third grade teacher, Mrs. Norton, did that. She read aloud to us. And when she was in her 80s and I was 50, I had an opportunity after a day of storytelling at a school that she came and visited in Alaska. She'd moved back to have give her a copy of Charlotte's Web that she read in my class and to sit right next to her while she began to read to me and I was back in her third grade classroom. That is the impact that Leanna has had on her students. She is a source of love and light. She is a champion of her students. I have sat in awe watching how she interacts with them and I consider her to be as much of a blessing in my own life as I hope that I am in hers. Lena, I love you. And now what we're going to do is to have you, um, maybe you already are. Are you off mute? You are. You are. You I'm are. Yes, so I everyone, am. may I introduce to you <laughs> Lena and Igna, who is Associate Professor of Linguistics at Odessa National University. Lena. Welcome to the Mastery Circle. This is an amazing group of people, and I know oh, they're so you. glad thank to you, welcome Dina. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be with you today and to share my feelings and my thoughts about our wonderful cooperation with Michelle. So um, just uh, the war is raging really because uh, I live in Odessa that's an absolutely beautiful fantastic place one million population uh, it's a, the pearl on the Black Sea the pearl really the place is beautiful and we have been bombed and shelled for two months already for more than two months yes and um, just yesterday they bombed um, just the hotels, seaside hotels, they bomb shopping malls, they're bombing civilian places, they're bombing bridges, and they're bombing oil depots. So just, they are really destroying our lives. They're destroying our lives, yeah. And so, and especially during this um, absolutely tragic period of time, just it's very important to just support the most vulnerable part of population. Of course, our kids, our teenagers, our 
just uh, the young generation and of course our older generation. And so just uh, I'm teaching students aged 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. So just bachelor and master programs at university. And they're majoring in English and German and French and Spanish and Italian. So lots and lots of languages we are learning at university. Some of my students had to flee to Europe and now they are staying in Poland, most of them stay in Poland. Uh, some of them moved to Germany, to France, to Romania, and still they're trying to go online and they just on and off, they join our classes online. Some of the students uh, had to flee to Western part of Ukraine, which is considered to be more or less safe. So they are just bombed, but not as just, <laughs> in so, to such great extent as uh, Odessa and uh, other strategic places. So to say, just because, uh, can you conjure up and envisage the map, yes, that the Crimea is occupied and they are moving from the Crimea just uh, to the eastern part, that's Mariupol, to join um, Donetsk and Lugansk occupied areas. And one of their strategic is to move west from the Crimea that via Odessa to join this uh, non-recognized occupied territory of Moldova, Pridnistrovia. So that's their strategic plan, so to say. Yeah, so that's why Odessa is always on their just, um, so to say, strategic plan to Mm -hmm. to occupy Odessa, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, and uh, when um, the war started, so the semester already was going on. We started just our semester uh, in um, early February and just the war started and we realized that we have to preserve our students actually to keep the kids mm -hmm. Uh, just as much as possible. And we had a talk, online talk, with the president of Odessa National University, and he gave us such a, an objective, such a goal, that psychological counseling is even more important mm -hmm. than just teaching languages or, or sciences. Psychological counseling, that you should support kids, they are so much scared. So they were so much uh, stressed out. They cannot sleep at night because of constant uh, air raids, because they they uh, just, they bomb us at night. Yes, they don't give us sleep. Yes, just to make us really just go crazy. So, and uh, of course we just, we were so blessed and we were so actually happy when Michelle gave us her just hand of love, support and comfort. And my students really uh, were so happy when they were invited to join Miss Michelle's sessions that she was so generously sharing with us. And uh, just there were some amazing times that it was just um, one of our session happened three hours after Odessa was bombed and the residential house where eight people were killed and among the uh, killed people were three months old baby. A little girl was killed together with her young mother and granny. So, and uh, so I, Michelle and I, so we didn't know how many students would be able to join us for our session when it just this tragedy happened in Odessa. But uh, girls, just not as many maybe as we were expecting, but um, like seven, eight girls joined us. And um, Michelle did absolute magic. She asked uh, my girls, to close their eyes and just to remember the sweetest memory 
from their childhood, maybe about their grandparents, maybe about their school children, uh, school, uh, school uh, kids, uh, schoolmates, maybe about their parents, about some funny moments, about holidays, some celebrations, whatever, whatever. And it was such a period of uh, meditation and um, relaxation. And after uh, just this period uh, was uh, finished, uh, Michelle kindly asked us uh, to open our eyes and to jot down some major ideas about their evoked memories, about their childhood memories. And I'll tell you that then each girl had a chance to speak out. And each of the girls had their sweetest childhood memories of their, of their dance classes, of their music classes, of their traveling. And one girl was telling about her beloved grandparents that she used to go to visit them so often. And now she cannot do it because of war, because they are just on the occupied territories and she cannot see her grandparents. And Michelle just um, so, I should say, just was so, uh, just um, she showed such great empathy and just such great sensitivity and support to each of the girls because she was listening so attentively to each of these students who were telling their stories. And then she was reflecting upon each story, make it in, uh, making this story absolutely special, unique, very meaningful, and uh, really just uh, so precious for each of the girls. And after uh, this session, my girls always write me feedback and they told me that it was such a, a absolutely fantastic feeling of relief of comfort and of peace inside their, uh, their souls. And they told me that they could never imagine that their maybe childhood, maybe not very serious memories happened to be so important and so meaningful with mm -hmm. Michelle's help. She made each story for these girls unique and uh, precious and important. So Michelle uh, also um, emphasizes the main idea for young generation that you should look into the future. Of course, now you are, as they say, war children, you are war children, you know what bombing, what shelling means, just tragically, that at the age of Yes, uh, early age, teenagers, they all know what air raid is and where they should rush to hide in bomb shelters. But the main thing is not to have hatred in your heart and in your soul and not to have despair, but just think about future. And every time Michelle meets us, she always emphasizes this idea and focuses on the, on the idea of... Uh, your future in Ukraine. Girls, think about your future. What uh, valuable qualities of your soul, heart and soul, you might use to build a strong, democratic new Ukraine after our victory. And so just it was one of the very interesting tasks. Uh, girls, it was like just they had this uh, value test uh, like a couple of days before our session and they all ticked um, top 10 qualities and they were presenting these qualities and speaking. Most of them, of course, said about family values, that they would bring family values to future Ukraine. Of course, they would bring their great love to the country. And of course, they would bring justice and democracy to new Ukraine. So, and just uh, then uh, there were some very interesting, uh, so to say, just, um, uh, assignments from Michelle to my students to think about their uh, just future jobs when they graduate from the university. And so interesting that, of course, my girls are specializing in uh, languages, so they might become teachers of English, French, German, Spanish, or they might be interpreting or just giving city tours, working with languages. But Michelle gave them this task, just push the limits, just 
let your imagination run wild and you might be not only teachers or interpreters or tour guides you might become architects or you might become just the people who would be inventing or, or IT specialists or you would be just uh, writing new books you would be promoting cultural projects of Ukraine whatever you like and uh, this task was also very beneficial for my students when they realized realize that they can get distracted from um, our just tragic everyday life circumstances, but just think about their participation of uh, their just input into the life of future Ukraine. And do you know that after that uh, tour, after each session, Michelle and I uh, have some discussion because it's interesting for us to see uh, the students' feedback because uh, students really uh, just unexpectedly for themselves, they uh, told us that even now, especially now, they feel so proud to be Ukrainians that maybe they've never been so proud of uh, just this citizenship before. They say, do you know what bravery is? Look at Ukraine. Or do you know what is to be brave? Look at Ukraine. And my students take it so close to their hearts and they all we uh, michelle and i were so thrilled when they told us sincerely that they would love to to stay in ukraine they would not like to immigrate from ukraine and they would bring their best uh, just uh, knowledge their just uh, skills and their love to build up new ukraine uh, when we celebrate our victory so, Michelle, dear, we are really would like to thank you from the bottoms of our hearts mm -hmm. that for these months that we've been working for months already, yes, just and each session is uh, some some new revelation for us that mm -hmm. every time we open up something new in ourselves, mm -hmm. Michelle brings out the best out out of my girls and out of me because I'm also a part of Miss Michelle's uh, class and uh, always with great respect and with great value to every every thought and every idea of my just girls my dear students girls yes mm -hmm. so michelle just we do hope that this um, great um, um, cooperation would continue and uh, maybe even after we win so we will just continue working yes and it's, students of course i believe that uh, it will be something to remember and uh, these um, sessions will always stay in their hearts i'm absolutely sure well, thank bless you, you Lena. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you know, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. you're welcome. You're welcome. You. you know, and can you see what a light she is? Can you see just how her students love her so much? I mean, this woman, she is amazing. And talk about attending to the psychological needs of her students. She got that request and she's living it like a thousand percent. Let me just tell you, because it's her nature as well. But one thing I would add, and, and, and thank you so much, Lena, is that here's what we know to be sure. Every single one of us has important stories inside of us. And often we don't even know our own story because we're living it, right? We don't see it. And part of the joy in my work, because I've done this work now for close to 40 years, working now, of course, with entrepreneurs and leaders across the world, is that when I listen to somebody, I am listening for that deeper story that isn't even articulated yet. And my job is to help to reflect that back what I'm hearing in a way that I, it allows a human being to see who they are, maybe even for the first time. And once we begin to see that possibility within ourselves, then we can begin to story that and as we do that, we begin to create. As I said to the girls, you know, we're creating this new future right in this moment. The words you say, the thoughts you have, you are creating the new Ukraine. So let us think about this. Let us articulate. Let us support each other. Let us speak the words. Let us 
let us create something out of nothing. That is what we're intended to do here as human beings. And I'm, I'm reminded as I say that, because I do this in my retreats, in fact, the retreat Diana and I will be doing here in, in Costa Rica in September is the same concept. We want to be present enough with each other to be able to bring those stories out, to reflect them back, and to give someone what? The gift of themselves. So I would finish, I'm looking at the time and I want to be respectful of it, um, is that there's a line from Crow and Weasel by Barry Lopez. And I kind of live by this one. And I think Leanna does too. When stories come to you, care for them and give them away when they're needed. Sometimes people need stories more than food to stay alive. That is, that is why we put stories in one another's memory. That is how we take care of one another. And so my darling Lena, this is what we're doing. We're putting stories in one another's memory. And when I, when I leave the voice messages for Roma, it's the same thing. He says, Michelle, where I was standing yesterday was bombed today. And he said, I'm feeling so much angst in my heart. And so of course I shared with him the story about the, 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 the Cherokee grandfather who tells his grandson, you have two wolves inside of you. They're always warring evil and good. And the one is one, the one is the other. And, and the grandchild says, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one that you feed, the one that you feed. And so what we need to do is to feed the good, the hope, the possibility. This is not to say we're not conscious of the other, taking an active role, resisting, standing firm, all the things that are necessary, but we cannot get to the place. And I found this when I was in Iraq and I was so devastated seeing things in Baghdad and Basra that just broke my heart. Children without enough nutrition, mothers losing their babies, their fetuses for lack of nutrition. And I saw, whole wards of children that weren't getting the medication that they needed. I went during the time of sanctions when it was actually against US law to even go there. And I went anyway, my tax dollars were funding it, helping to fund it. And I remember tearing skin off my feet at night uh, in my hotel room and the doctor wrapping them every morning. And I found myself recently doing the very same thing. And when I caught myself doing it, I told Roma about this. I said, Roma, I realized that all of these images and devastation is so deeply painful for me that I am actually, I'm actually in a place I don't want to be because I can't be of service that way. And I had to remind my own self of that story and say, feed the wolf of good, Michelle. Feed the wolf of love and hope, both to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. That's what this is about. So Leanna, thank you so much for the gift of my being able to be there in this way with you. I never thought I would go full circle with Russia and Ukraine. We are already planning a celebration in Ukraine in person and I'm gonna yes, be there. Yes, We're yes, gonna yes. storytell. <laughs> We're gonna pick up that thread too in person. But in the meantime, we have this opportunity to share love. And I say to all of you here in the Master Circle, you are an extraordinary group of people. You live this every single day in your lives. That's why I feel so privileged to be a part of this circle and why I'm so honored to bring Leanna to you today because I know everything we've said resonates in the heart and minds of each one of you because each one of you are exactly this and you come from this place and this is the work each of you are doing and as I said to the girls the other day, you know, when you spend three hours in the bomb shelter today, when you expected Lisa to, to be walking the park with your friend, I know you reached out and squeezed her hand. I know you told each other that you loved one another. And I said to her, that moment, that exchange, those words, that is what is enabling you to endure. So you may be in a bomb shelter, but you are in the space of love. 
And that's what matters. So thank you very much, Lena, for coming today. Thank you all so much. And if you have any questions, I don't know if we have any time for that, but I'm just watching the clock so that we we stay on track. So you, you have, have some questions. Yeah, we could have some questions for you and Elena. Mm -hmm. I think Bill has his hand up. Thanks. Oh, I oh I am just so just so touched. Oh, thank you both so much, thank so you. much. Um, as exemplars, um, and I just I just briefly wanted to mention that that we had um, uh, Navid uh, visiting yes. us earlier. I think I don't see him now, but from Pakistan, and that is his mission. Also, is mm -hmm. uh, Kahani Sano tell a story, and mm -hmm. it's a way of bridging communities and they're not facing political war but religious war That's where right. he is um and oh my gosh <laughs> it's like we have had storytellers from three continents here this morning so <laughs> right. i'm really moved thank you very That's much right. thank, thank you Bill. thank you thank you and anyone else anyone else yes oh. um i have to thank you for the work you're doing is so wonderful what the world needs and we uh used to uh do team buildings for CEOs and their teams. And it was based on storytelling. Yes, yes. So we would, they'd always have some values and we'd encourage them to create some stories about how this value or that value impacted them personally or impacted their team. And mm -hmm. one of them, uh, one year, one of the participants died in a boating accident. Mm -hmm. And they found this blue chip in his pocket, which we gave out to symbolize high return activities like being present by mutual support, building the team. And people asked, well, what, what is this blue chip for? So he had a chance to explain. He was carrying that around to remind him to be present, to be, be here now, we called it. So it really works. It stays with people those stories it just stays with them oh thank you, thank you. I, I think carolyn has her name uh, her hand up also i do huh oh it's almost hard to speak after such a beautiful heartfelt presentation the music in your voice is astounding <laughs> thank you for that and i have a question so elena's class is is young women. Is that mm -hmm. because all the young men are holding rifles? Elena, that's for you, dear. Okay, okay. Uh, so traditionally, uh, young girls opt for linguistics. I don't know, maybe it's the same in the US, but in Ukraine, young girls opt for linguistics and very few men. So Roman, Roma, actually who was just this magic who helped uh, me and Michelle just meet together. So he was my student mate. He was like unique man, just surrounded by girls, by girls. For he example, loved ten it. Girls he loved and one it. boy in the students group. One boy and ten girls. So yes. actually, um, I'll tell you that I still I have a couple of boys. They are um, young. They're 18, 19. But I'll tell you, fighting age now in Ukraine, they say fighting age is from 18 till 60. So they are, so in Ukraine, they are not called to already to the army, not, not, they say that professional, professional uh, military men are defending and fighting for Ukraine, professionals. And our student boys, they are not professional. So I, I hope that that they will not be drafted to the army because they, though as Raman, he's uh, just a, a translator, interpreter, language instructor, but he joined the territorial defense group. So territorial defense group uh, is actually compiled of non-professional military. There are teachers there, IT mm. specialists, some just uh, uh, people or civilians, civilians join territorial defense group group yes 
so I'll tell you that, for example, now in each university group, we have uh, like half of the group. Uh, half of the group is missing because they write uh, to us that we are volunteering. We are volunteering, we are helping refugees because lots of refugees uh, in Odessa coming from occupied territories. And uh, some people, even I know that uh, two boys actually joined territorial defense group, yes. Elena, thank you. Thank now, you. Patricia, I want to check back with you because I know you have something else yet to do. So do we do we have time for one more question or do we need to move to the next thing that's on the agenda? Patricia? <laughs> Let's see. I'm not sure. Huh. We may have oh. lost her. Well, you know, I just have... A, uh okay yeah let's just do well, wi-fi problem she just she just said wi-fi problems so yeah let's just so do we, one more question one more. and then we'll move on to our closing. thank you tim thank you tim yeah. ron has his hand up yeah ron yes, has uh, had his hand michelle up. one of the things that touched me by you and i've known you for a few years now mm -hmm. i never really knew you okay and you become my new hero in, in your career of 40 years for humanity, we all try to help in our way, but none have done what you have done. And you've become my new inspiration. Aww. And your, your, your wonderful partner from the Ukraine has given me a new understanding of what Ukraine is all about. We don't get that in the media, but between both of you today, I learned a tremendous lesson and I will reciprocate. Thank you very much. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Patricia, you're back. You have to unmute, though. I, oh, sorry. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. It was amazing. Thank you, Elena, for coming. We'll be praying for you and your safety, your students, all Thank your you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are in our prayers every single day. 